so much, first of all, to e the eCampus team for inviting me here today. I have to tell you that um, whew, I'm just, I'm feeling so impressed. I was honestly feeling a little bit emotional just watching all of this recognition and celebration for, <clears throat> for great online teaching because it's something that is really hard to find. Uh, so I, I really want to applaud all the hard work of everybody in this room. Um, it, it, what you do, it, it's, it's just really hard. So I am so honored for being here. Uh, I, I started teaching online. Um, I was an art history professor in the California Community College System. And I started teaching online in 2003. And uh, much of what I'm going to talk to you about today really kind of came out of my own teaching practices and have, has scaled and morphed into different directions over the years. And right now, I work at the state level for our system. Uh, and I support professional development. So I support uh, the high quality online teaching and learning across all 114 of our colleges. We uh, serve 2.1 million students in our system. About 28% of our enrollments are online. Most are not programs. They're students who choose to take some online classes to roll them in with what they're doing on campus. We serve a very diverse group of students, which I'll talk a little bit more about in my presentation. And um, we have over 60,000 faculty, and seven out of 10 of them are part-time and teach at multiple institutions. So it's really messy. <laughs> Um, so to get us started, first of all, I do have my slides and, and some links to additional resources um, at this site, brokansky.com slash OSU, and Brokansky is also my Twitter handle. If anyone is on Twitter, I'd, I'd love to connect with you that way. To get us started, um, I'm going to ask you to pause for a moment and reflect. This is going to be just a quiet reflection exercise. And I want you to feel safe in this environment. And I want to tell you from the outright that I'm not going to ask you to share this with anyone else. I think that's important to know going into it. But what I'd like you to do is just take a moment to reflect on your life experiences and identify a time when you didn't feel like you were included. Identify a, an experience in your life when you, you didn't feel included. And as you filter through those memories and you, you select one to, to think about and to reflect on, just give yourself a moment to acknowledge the emotions that came along with that experience. Okay, thank you for partaking in that exercise. Um, I want to acknowledge that those thoughts, those feelings that you were just recognizing are not good feelings. They're really not good feelings. Um, and oftentimes we don't recognize how powerful those feelings are or um, how impactful they are and how much they influence the things that we do. Uh, contemporary research in neuroscience is really starting to find deep connections between our feelings and actually what's happening in our brains. And that's something that I don't think we acknowledge. Is that going off? Sorry. <laughs> it feels like you can hear me and then you can't hear me. Um, but it's something that I think we need to acknowledge more wholeheartedly in higher education as educators particularly educators of students who we don't see, who aren't in front of us and sharing the same physical space with us. It's gonna be a really hard thing to do, but it's very important. Um, in higher education, you know, we, we privilege, we privilege the, the process of cognition and, and the act of constructing knowledge and, and so forth, but it's not as often that we also look at the effective domain of, of, of learning. And that is something that I think we do need to know more, know more about and be actively embracing as we design and facilitate our own online courses. This quote here from uh, John Roosh, 
I think is really powerful. I've had it in my presentations for um, many, many years, and every time I read it, I think it's becoming more and more important. Most faculty have been well prepared in the disciplines they teach, but too few have been prepared for the reality of today's students, the ways they learn, and the cognitive and the effective challenges they bring with them through the open door. Now, the quote there from John, he is very much affiliated with community colleges, which is where I come from. We, we educate the top 100% of students. Anyone who wants to come to a community college gets to come to a community college. And the point that I want to, one of the points I really want to have each of you reflecting on today as you go about your day and you go back to your, what you do um, with your classes and your students is that things are changing and the demographics of the students that you're serving here are shifting. Um, I've heard that alluded to in small ways today that the percentage of, of eCampus or the, the, the age of eCampus students is getting younger. We're starting to have more students of color, those types of things. So when you look at data points, it's really important to look at them in context and see how they are shifting because as we start sh serving more students, we're serving different students. And that's really an important point about what this presentation is about. Oftentimes in education, we, in higher education, we use this word success, and we use quantified data points to really analyze and, and, and measure how, how effective we're being, right? Well, what's our, what's our success rate? So we do that all the time in our system. Um, and what you're looking at here, and for those of you who can't see it in detail, this is, a, this is charting the 2015-2016 online success rates in our system. And the horizontal bar at the top is our statewide success rate. 66% of students um, who, who take an online class complete with an A, B, or C. That's how we're measuring success in our system. And that's actually only 4% off of our face-to-face uh, -face success, which we're super excited about because there used to be a really big gap there. But when we disaggregate that data and we break it out by race and ethnicity, we see that um, the golden bar, the orangey bar, that's our statewide average, and our white and Asian students exceed that. But our African American, our American Alaskan, American Indian, Alaskan Natives, and Hispanics and Pacific Islander students are all below that bar. This is, these are the equity gaps that we are committed to figuring out. These are the equity gaps that we're talking about on a regular basis to try to understand why is that happening. And this is a really significant shift for us to be making. In higher education, we're coming out of a time when we used to think that treating all of our students equally was the fair thing to do. But it's really important to acknowledge that if we treat everyone equally, it's assuming that everybody is the same, and that's not that's just not the way it is. And so that's the shift from equality to equity. And it's really hard work. It requires us to recognize our own privileges, our unconscious biases, and these are the things that we're really trying to work on in our system. And it's, it's, it's important for our face-to-face -face classes. It's really important and even harder for our online classes. So a question that we move forward with is what are the barriers that exist within our classes and institutional processes that disproportionately impact our students? What are some of those barriers? Um, when I sat down at the table today, I saw the great card about um, how if a student can't afford a textbook, that's a roadblock. And so this wonderful movement, the OER movement, is really trying to remove that barrier. So that's a perfect example of, a, of an equity an uh, equity approach to equity that, that, that many institutions are taking. So we know that 67% of our students identify as an ethnic minority. We know that four in 10 are first generation college students. We recently found out through a study with the um, Hope Center from Temple University, the wonderful Sarah Goldrick Rabb, who is amazing, uh, one in five are homeless or don't have a stable place to live. One in two can't afford balanced meals or worry that food will run out before they have money to buy more. So when I think about teaching online, I think about these students in the classes, and I think about things like late assignments, or the students who you know, don't log in as early as they should to their first online class. And we're trying to get faculty to really kind of think more compassionately about what might be happening on the other end instead of you know, making quick judgments that are so easy to make. 
We also know that when we look at some um, of the research, particularly uh, for community college students, there was a study done very recently in 2016, what course design feature influences online student performance the most? The, the thing that, that rose to the top was the quality of instructor to student interactions, which I found really fascinating because if you look at most course design rubrics, that's not part of course design, that's part of facilitation. And so this facil facilitation piece of an online course is really, really critical, particularly when you start to serve more, serve more underrepresented, underrepresented students. When we look at the um, validation theory, and this is, not, this is not based on online students, but this is a well-regarded um, theory from the work of uh, Rendon. When did you know you could be successful in college? These are some of the things that rise to the surface there. When an instructor took time to learn my name, when an instructor gave me opportunities to see myself be successful, when I could see myself in the course's curriculum, sorry for the last typo and the last line there, when an instructor became a partner in my learning. So again, that student to instructor relationship is really, really important, face to face as well as online. But how do we do that? And what does it look like if it doesn't exist? So I want to have you just listen to this video here by um, an online student, Matthew, and ponder what it might feel like to be in his shoes. I can see that a professor isn't trying to interact with the course. And I, it's just little things like the automatic announcements that only show up at 12 a.m. on a Sunday. Like You know it's all... Uh, automated, they're just not, or you leave a question and ask the <coughs> professor and three weeks later you get a response, like, that's when I start to judge, like, I just wish you wouldn't be here, like, I wish you would focus your energy somewhere else because I'm not learning anything, but, yeah, so that's the only judgment is when you're not doing anything. We don't care when you make mistakes, though. I hope you heard that last part. We don't care when you make mistakes. Yeah, so, um, what it feels like when the quality of the interactions are not meaningful. Not the quantity, but the quality. It's a, it, it's a really different shift that we're thinking about here. And so when students are in an online class and they, they feel like their instructor doesn't care about their learning, that's a barrier. And that's something that we're trying to draw attention to and, and help make some shifts on. So now I'm gonna play a clip here from Kelly Ann, and this is a clip that was taken from a, a student a student panel that we recently held in February with a large online, free online conference record, we recorded, or we coordinated. We had about 400 people live in this session, and I want to acknowledge that she was super nervous answering this question. Um, she was being asked to describe how she feels about um, late policies and what she thinks is a fair late policy, and she's got a little story that she tells. I feel that when the instructor assigns or gives us um, a, a due date, I feel that we need to be um, cognizant of that, respectful of that, and do our very best to, to get it done. However, there's the juxtaposition there is that we are taking online classes because we have life outside of the classroom. So the very reason that we are taking this um, communicates what we expect things happen. So being able to have that connection with your instructor and, and obviously be reasonable. Um, for me, I, I was traveling a lot um, to see my mother-in-law who wasn't well and we were getting stuck in airports and I was, I mean, I carry my desk everywhere with me, my little laptop and everything. And um, I also suffered, um, I had an accident where I suffered a TBI. Um, I got in line and I'm going to give her a big shout out, Cindy Wilhelson from Costa College. I'm, I'm having a trouble here. I'm in Florida. I can't get to the pharmacy. So, and she just pushed it out a few days. I was able to breathe. I was able to um, get my work done. I'm going to cry. And I, that self-confidence came back. The, um, I did well. And um, I was so appreciative of that function. Very often I haven't seen it in a face-to-face -face class. So um, just a little bit of context there. What Kellyanne was referring to is she had a significant um, uh, spinal or ne neck injury, and she was in a great deal of pain. And she was trying to get to her pharmacy, and she was struggled, and she was traveling, and 
just trying, you know, making that leap and reaching out to her instructor was a really hard thing for her to do. And her instructor responded with an extension and the due date. And that she talked reflects there about how that really, um, you know, got she got her motivation, she got her confidence back. Those are the moments that we don't see. You know, we don't we don't see that rich, thick, important data when we're looking at our success rates. And those kinds of interactions are the things that we think can really make a difference, um, particularly in improving equity gaps. Um, and so when we talk about quality courses, what we try to do in our system is really uh, think about online course design and facilitation as two sides of the same coin. They're both really, really important. Um, and the number one thing is we're trying to get faculty to really reflect and think about how are you coming across to your students. I genuinely, I had an instructor in one of my professional development courses, um, this was many years ago, say that she reached out to one of her online students to give, him, to give him some feedback or ask a question via email. And he responded with, oh my gosh, I always thought my online instructors were computers. And that was probably 10 years ago, and it sticks with me so much. But today, as I read about all of these advances in AI, I start thinking, holy cow, you know, I, that's actually, it's actually starting to happen. So I really want to pr say that in, there are some things that computers should not do, and we, we need human-to-human -human relationships to be at the center of all of our educational experiences doesn't mean that there isn't a place for technology, obviously. You know, I'm, we're here talking about online education, but that's first and foremost. So what we're doing in our system and the team that I'm a part of, um, we, we provide professional development at in an array of ways, and we offer many, many courses. On, we have a whole sequence of, of professional development courses on course design, and we have a whole sequence on online teaching. And we also offer certificate paths for both of those areas. The online courses that we offer are taken by faculty across the state and they're facilitated by, by faculty within, within our state also. So my team kind of coordinates um, these courses and then we hire faculty to teach them on a contract basis for their peers and that's our model. One of the courses is humanizing online teaching and learning and that's what I'm gonna drill into a little bit here. So I talked about some of the problems and the barriers that we're trying to overcome and so what I'm gonna do now is show some of the practices that we're engaging faculty with to, to start to improve those barriers. So this is a four week professional development, online professional development course Again, by and for online educators in our system, promoting human presence for equitable learning. Uh, we have an infographic which is linked to the resource page that I sent you, but really the three core elements of humanizing that, we're, that we are focusing on are presence, empathy, and awareness. And how do you, what, are, what do these things mean, and how do you foster these, these, um, these elements in an online environment? Social presence is really critical to um, the course. It's one of the theories that faculty are introduced to. And so there are lots of different definitions of social presence depending on the literature you look at. I think what's most important to note is that this, this is nothing new. There's a long standing, rich um, you know, uh, dialogue and um, evidence of social presence really being an important and impactful thing for online learning. Um, essentially, so you could you could kind of crystallize it as uh, when you know when you make that transition between feeling like you're interacting with names on a screen to a real person, or you feel like all of a sudden you're you're really part of a group instead of just logging into an L a learning management system. That's really kind of the effect. That's what social presence is. And the research also shows that um, in online classes, student satisfaction, interaction, and depth of learning all increase along with social presence. So it's a really important part of community building. And I'm gonna just walk you through some practices here um, that we're introducing our participants to. So in this course, it's really important to understand that we are both um, introducing them to practices, but also modeling those practices at the same time. So I was one of the, um, I was the designer of this course, but I no longer facilitated it. Um, I passed it over to several of my colleagues, so you're gonna see a few of them featured in some of these practices. Uh, the course is taught in Canvas, which is something that I understand we have in common, so that's often a common question I get. 
But one of the practices is this notion of a liquid syllabus. Um, and I have a, a three minute video on a resource site if you want to explore that a little bit more. It's not intended to take the place of like a full blown syllabus that lives in your course. But we're trying to get faculty to think a little bit differently about producing public content. So something that isn't locked behind a learning management system. So if you could imagine yourself, for example, um, as a student who's enrolled in a class and you get it, you get a welcome email from your instructor a few days before the class starts, a week before the class starts. That's a practice that we try to model for all of our classes. So now we started saying, well, you know, what if in that email there was a, just a, a link to click on to learn a little bit more? So this liquid syllabus here is um, designed in Google Sites. It could be done with any website tool. Oh, no, I don't want you to see my Gmail. Well, that's embarrassing. How, oh, that, those are all my silly little tabs that I have saved, okay. So let me just make that a little bigger. So this is the, the liquid syllabus. Um, it, in, it includes essentials about the course, but not everything. But at the very top, and this is the part I wanted to show you, Hello and welcome. I'm Tracy Shalen, Distance Education Coordinator at Southwestern College in San Diego County. And I'm Mike Smedshammer, Distance Education Coordinator at Modesto Junior College. If you're wondering what a humanizing class is all about, spend some time with our online syllabus here and have a look around and see what we're going to be doing over the next four weeks together. What you learn in this class will give you new ways to connect with your students, and we think it will make online teaching feel richer and more rewarding, too. Video is a big part of that. Isn't it nice to be able to see and hear your instructors for this course? We are looking forward to sharing and collaborating with you. See you soon. And something else I should add, unlike you all, our faculty don't really have instructional designers or multimedia support. That's, that's a broad statement, but I, I think that if you had like a room full of our faculty this many, they'd all go. So um, we're really also trying to help faculty get more savvy with using video, but really low stake video. You know, those are videos that Mike and Tracy recorded on their phones one sent theirs to the other, and the other kind of just merged them together in Camtasia, uploaded it to YouTube, and captioned it. So these are skills that we're really fostering in the humanizing course, not the Camtasia part, we don't get into that, but just the recording and the captioning part, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then when participants come into the course in Canvas, this is what they're greeted with. Hi, Hi everyone. everyone. Welcome, Welcome to, to our, our homepage. homepage. I'm Mike Smedshammer. And I'm Tracy Shalen. Click the Start Here button to go to the first page in our Getting Started module. This module will get you oriented to our class. We'll, we'll see, see you there. there. So really trying to use human presence in super simple ways to bring down that anxiety. Um, you know, the students who think, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never taken an online class. Can I do this? I really can't get it. I don't have the time to take the class on campus. Those anxieties in those, that, that first week, they're really, really big. And so these are some of the strategies that we're using to, to overcome them with our students. They're very simple, but they, they really do make a difference. Um, and so again, you know, these are faculty participants who are experiencing this, right, and kind of having these aha moments. Another practice um, is one that I have to credit Fabiola Torres, who you see um, in this video. She's another one of the facilitators of our humanizing course. Uh, and she's really, uh, really bringing it home when it comes to the impact of mobile video. So trying to, you know, I, I said that Tracy and Mike were on campus, you know, recording those the, the videos in the liquid syllabus. And so here's um, Fabi at Disneyland. Hi everyone, I'm saying hello to you from beautiful Disneyland, Tom Sawyer Island, my favorite spot. I like to send random videos to my students, you know, just to make them feel like I'm thinking about them when I'm in a place like Tom Sawyer Island. That's it. See you guys. 
So dropping those little breadcrumbs and getting folks to think differently about videos and announcements. Um, Tracy and Mike and Fabi do a great job of including these, um, these video postcards in their, their Canvas announcements. Hi, everyone. For this week's introductory video, I am coming to you from the gas station. Why not? I'm here until the tank fills, and replenishing my fuel makes me think about where I'm headed. Not just in my car, but also where we're headed in our course. These are so memorable. Um, people still come to Tracy and say, I took your class, I remember the gas station video. <laughs> And that's the thing, like really when you start to drill into the research around social presence and you look at the open-ended qualitative data, you'll see students make comments like, I remember he was leaving me video feedback, but I remember the most is his little, his little boy cracked the door open behind him and closed it real quick. <laughs> those are the things that foster human connection. And those are the things that build trust. Those are the things that make people willing to reach out and say, hey, I'm having this problem, can you help me? Instead of dropping a class. Oops, I missed one. So this other option or practice here is something, a new term that we're playing with that we're, that we're calling adaptive teaching. One of the biggest things we hear from faculty is how can I give the high touch to everybody? So first of all, the, the videos are, you know, that's one to many, so that's, that's, that's one level of humanizing. But then we do really advocate and try to get faculty to do individualized um, support for students. So what we're trying to get them to think about is like, um, you know, if you walk out into your garden and you've got a can of water and you look at your entire garden and you've got all these plants and flowers, are you gonna go around and give that equal amounts of that water to everyone or are you gonna take a moment to really understand which plants need it the most? And so that's what we mean by adaptive teaching. We know that you, there's only so much of you to go around. So the practice that we um, encourage them to use is something called a glamorous name, student info form. And it's simply a survey. It's, again, embedded in week one, that really important high-stake week where there's a lot of anxiety, just so much going on. Um, and I have a, a Google form that you're welcome to make a copy of at the URL down below. You can include any questions you want in that, but the two questions that are really, really important, first of all, not only what is your name if you're using an external tool, um, but to, to let them know that this is a survey that's only going to go to you, it's for your knowledge to help you support your students, ask them these two questions. In one word, describe how you're feeling about this class. It's amazing. When you see those responses, there'll be the students, great, excited, fine. And then there's probably about 5 to 10% of students from my experience that say, overwhelmed, anxious, nervous. Those are the students that need your high touch. And so we practice that in the course also, um, and, and our, our participants fill out this form too. And then we all also ask them, please share one thing that may interfere with your success in this class. Oftentimes we hear things like, work, I'm really busy, I have this going on. Um, we have, I, when I used to use this form, I had students who, multiple students, I'm pregnant and I'm going to deliver in week nine. Um, you know, my mom's on hospice and I'm a primary caregiver. That's an opportunity for these, these elements of self-disclosure to come out. Um, and what's amazing about this tool, it's phenomenal. And I've had a lot of people tell me how helpful this is because then when you have a student, if you're, maybe you're thinking, well, I'm already aware when my students aren't engaging and I reach out to them, but if you have this knowledge, and you can reach out to a student and send them a video and say, hey, you know, I remember you sharing with me that this was going on and I just want you to know that I'm here and is there anything I can do to support you? And we practice this in the humanizing course and we have people who come to us and say, how do you do that for everyone? How do, and we say, we don't do it for everyone. We only do it for those who, who we know really need it. So um, that's, a, that's a helpful practice. And then also telling of stories. Um, the little videos that you saw, like Fabi at Disneyland, and kind of making the announcements and just contextualizing them into your own life. You may be at a conference, a professional conference, and you could say, hey, look, you know, I'm here to learn more about this, this, and this, but I'm still here as your teacher. And that really adds a lot 
to um, your own social presence makes you a real person. Um, when I used to teach the history of photography, you know, in my videos, I would hold up old old photos of my great grandmother and kind of tell her, their, her story and wow, how that affected me growing up. So opportunities to bridge your, you know, the the the, court, the content in your course with your own life, but also encourage your students to be making those reflections as well. We know that when um, neuroscience has shown is a process called neural coupling. When you listen to someone tell a story, you empathize with them. The same parts of your brain fire that are being fired in the person telling the story. And that's a very powerful thing. So tools really matter here. And this is another way that we're bringing video in. So ensuring that our faculty are getting, uh, understanding how to use YouTube. They all have their own free YouTube account. We ask them to set one up if they don't have one yet. We teach them what the difference is between setting a video to public and unlisted and private. And the first video they make can be of anything. Like we have a lot of people who just kind of show us their dog, say, hi, this is their dog. So they're not on camera because that's a barrier. They're really nervous about it. But then they go into YouTube, let the auto captions kind of kick into gear. They edit the auto captions and then they submit it as an assignment. And the, the feedback we get from that first assignment is incredible. Like, I had no idea how easy this was, you know? Or, oh my gosh, my, my, my daughter finally thinks I'm cool. Um, <laughs> and then Adobe Spark, Flipgrid, and VoiceThread are also really powerful tools that we like to encourage the use of and experiment with. This is one of our participants, Syl Arena, and I'm just gonna, this is excerpted from a Flipgrid discussion. Um, Flipgrid is a free tool that, um, is offered now, it's been recently purchased by Microsoft and it's free to all educators and it's an asynchronous conversation tool using video. Um, and so this is one of his videos from the class who was a participant. Hey everybody, my name is Syl Arena. Syl is short for Sylvester. I teach digital photography at Cuesta College in San Luis Obispo. I'm down at Morro Strand, the beach that runs from the town of Morro Bay where I live, all the way up to Cayucos on the central coast. And I'm down here with my sweet dog, Ruby, who is a golden retriever. She's 13 years old and she hates to be photographed, but I'm distracting her with a rock because she loves to fetch rocks at the beach. And one of the things that I'm most proud of is that Ruby has recently been diagnosed with cancer, which of course is super so sad, but she's helped us raise our three boys and we're taking great care of her. Um, and I come down to the beach with her every day because this is where she loves to be. So it's a wonderful way to spend the summer. Looking forward to getting to know all of you a little bit better over the course of the coming four weeks. And of course, looking forward to learning how to humanize my online courses so I can engage with my photo students in the coming years. Take care. You will remember, Syl, for a very long time and Ruby as well, right? Yeah. Um, the facilitators of the class brought this, uh, brought this to my attention. They said, oh, you have to use Syl's video. The whole class, everybody was asking about Ruby the whole time. You know, it, it, do, it really does foster connections. That was interesting. I didn't know I had that transition in there. It scared me for a second. <laughs> so where are, <laughs> where are we now uh, charting the impact? This is the hard thing. It's always really, it's, it's a significant, like well-known problem that it's really hard to chart the impact of professional development, but that's where we are now. And I'm really excited to share that just last week, um, we were awarded a grant to really start to research some of the impact of these humanizing practices, particularly in equity graphs equity gaps in STEM classes in our system. So that'll be a three-year endeavor that we're just gonna be starting on this summer. But I do have some, some, some um, impact um, evidence that I wanted to share with you at this point. Uh, this is a quote from uh, one of our alums. This was a course that I facilitated. He said, I almost wanted to quit the evening the short video was due. The empathy shown by Michelle drove me to want to get it done. If nothing else, to let her know believing in me did not go unnoticed or unappreciated. I used to have the belief that I have very little to do with the success of my online students. I used to tell them that I have all the math videos made, all the resources are there for them, and eventually it's up to them to succeed. While I still believe parts of those statements, I was very wrong in saying I have little to do in their success. 
So these are these deep, powerful reflections, again, through the process of experiencing uh, an online class with a present, empathetic, and aware instructor is, um, we're, we're seeing evidence that it is shifting mindsets. This is Colleen Harmon with a quick uh, video reflection. I learned to get over some unwarranted trepidation, but more than anything, the principles of humanizing online learning have continued to stay with me and to challenge me to improve my courses each time I teach. In fact, even while I'm teaching. So I find that the level of interaction among the students is higher, and I'm getting some really great feedback from the students. That trepidation that she reflected on is another really big barrier to getting faculty to engage with these practices. So giving them a safe place like our course to really work through and like, okay, wh where's the lighting? How do I get situated in a camera? You know, it's, it's okay to say um and kind of be silly and make a mistake on video, which all the facilitators are modeling, really does help. Being introduced to Flipgrid and Adobe Spark was like finding the closet to Narnia. <laughs> The number of times I hear people say, faculty don't want to try new things, you know, and I just, I, you're wrong, you're wrong. They're so thirsty for relevant, easy to use tools. Uh, so this is something that we often hear. And this is an Adobe Spark video that was made after the class was over that this participant sent to me, Michelle McFarlane, who teaches agriculture online. So I'm gonna share this with you. She had a discussion forum that she called like the student lounge or something like that. So she changed the name of the forum to the truck stop and she talks about why. The truck stop may seem like an odd name for a discussion board designed for student interaction. Well, there's a story that makes it the perfect name for such a place. This is a picture of me and my dog Lulu. I was about five years old. This part of my childhood, I spent living in a small town called Roxton in Eastern Texas. This town was really small. It was an agricultural town and there was not much there. My dad was a farmer. We lived on a large farm way out of town. On the weekends and during the summer, there was nothing more than I, that I looked forward to other than going to the truck stop. A truck stop is a facility that's usually by a highway and includes a diner, fuel pumps, and other services for long haul truckers. Truck stops often serve locals too. In my childhood experience, it was where the farmers went for breakfast. It was more than just a place to grab some food though. It was a place where the local agricultural community came alive. As I sat and enjoyed my pancakes, politics, commodity prices, the weather, and the latest town gossip were exchanged. Deals were made and laughs were shared. In a time before cell phones, social media, and instant messaging, the truck stop on the outskirts of Roxton, Texas, served as a discussion forum for the locals. So that was, I think, a one minute and 10 second, oops, video. Um, and so there was a lot packed in there, but you know, she was really, really smart in the way that she wove storytelling in there, right? Pretty amazing. And think about how that really starts to, you know, demystify the idea of a professor online, someone who you don't know and makes you more approachable. Um, so Adobe Spark Video, if, if you're not familiar with it, it's a free Adobe Spark, Spark product. Um, captioning does not, it not, doesn't support captioning, but you can download the video and host it somewhere else and have it captioned. And it's super beautiful and easy to use. I encourage you to play around with it a little bit. So again, more, I'm so excited to finally know how to use YouTube. It's kind of like we're bridging this cultural gap with like getting faculty to feel more comfortable with this like, you know, this, this whole language out there that they hear all the time about, but they don't know how to actually put to use. So a lot of um, positive feedback about that. And we're seeing evidence of the video, um, the mobile videos also. Hola, bienvenidos. Me llamo Alicia Caballero Christensen. Hello, welcome. My name is Alicia, and I will be the instructor for your class, MLAT 30B. 
survey of Latin American film. I hope you enjoy movies. I hope you are excited about learning about Latin American history. You'll notice that I'm standing right in front of my neighborhood theater, the Grand Lake Theater. I love movies. While I'm not a film scholar, I'm actually an ethnic studies scholar, I love going and watching film and then deconstructing them, analyzing them, understanding the social political context. So just for the sake of time, I'll skip over that. But again, taking students out into her own environment, her own neighborhood, kind of connecting what they're going to be learning about to herself is really great. Um, I sent students my first postcard and received a gushing email from a student who was planning to drop, but then saw he had a kind teacher and decided to stay. My communications with students have uncovered so many of the obstacles my students are facing that I would have no idea about. The cool thing is that I've been a then been able to refer them to resources on and off campus. It's been an eye-opening in so many ways that something so simple could mean so much. Wow. And this, this person also sent me the email that, that basically um, spurred this, and she sent an email to her student saying, you know, I noticed you've kind of, your participation has dropped off. Hey, I just wanna reach out, see how things are going, see if I can help, and let you know the hardest part of the semester is behind us. And the student wrote back saying, I can't believe how much, that, that meant so much to me that you would send that email, and this is how she, she responded to me. I, this was actually an interaction we had on Twitter that this comes from. So I want to end with um, what I see as the greatest barrier to making this happen. It's not technology. It's not access to technology. It's not, oh, I don't know how to use the technology. It's, um, it's, it's our willingness to put ourselves in a vulnerable place to try something new, to move away from you know, the way we've always done things, but also to move into, does anyone know the work of Brene Brown? Shout out Brene Brown but to move into the arena and to take off that emotional armor that we wear as professors, that's so hard to do. But when you do, that's when the connections are gonna to start to be made with your students. Um, relationships start with psychological safety, which requires us to take off our armor and be vulnerable. And the last thing about vulnerability that I want you to think about is this quote from Brene Brown, who's a researcher on um, effective topics. When we start losing our tolerance for vulnerability, uncertainty, risk-taking, we move away from the things we need and crave the most, like joy and love and belonging, trust, empathy, and creativity. And it's my hope that these elements that are listed at the end of this quote will always stay at the center of education, whether those experiences happen face-to-face -face or online. So with that, thank you very much for having me, and I'd be happy to, I think we have time for a couple questions. Kind of like, have you heard of Marco Polo? Yeah, I have heard it, of Marco Polo. Is it kind of like that, but for your classroom? So it's a little bit different. Um, I haven't used Marco Polo, so I shouldn't pretend to know. I, I know how it works, but it's more. It's more like a you ha literally have a, a visual grid of all of the responses, and then you just click on the the image of the person that you want to hear the response from. So the instructor leaves a prompt. And then there are the responses, and then you can also leave responses to the responses. So it's it's a video dialogue, um, and it works really well with Canvas. I strongly recommend using if you'd want to, if uh, you know, go to your eCampus team is what I should say. But I tell you what, what we do is we recommend that um, instructors use the there's a free LTI integration with Can with Canvas, and once you set that up. The students who use it don't have to set up any accounts. They don't have to like you know verify their email or anything, um, and they have to go through Canvas to actually access the assignment. But we we've had a lot of success with it. It does have an option to turn auto captioning on, which I think is the default is off, so you have to enable that on. And it is auto captioning. Um, it's pretty accurate, but you all know how that. And it, it, it really, I mean, if you're think, if you haven't seen like auto captioning in the past like two years, it's improved significantly. But it still isn't 100%. And we've been advocating for them to allow a user to edit the captions, and that option still isn't there. But so, are students able to see each other's? Oh, okay. Yes. Cool. 
Yeah, it's a it's a peer to peer peer to peer asynchronous video conversation basically. The only thing I would say about that is that it does require the video. You know, and I often think there may there may be students who for legitimate reasons don't want to be on video. So that's like the one I think barrier that I try to be sensitive to and that's personally why I really love VoiceThread. So VoiceThread gives you options, but something to think about, yeah. Thank you so much everyone. Thank you.